Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. Suppose it came to pass that you needed to invert this Laplace transform. We need to do a partial fraction expansion, and this is a little more challenging than the ones we've done so far because we have this cube sitting here. All of the partial fraction expansions we've done so far have had unique roots. So the trick here is I'll actually need to write three terms. You need a number of terms matching the power of the root. And for the first term, just write a single version of that root. And then you keep working your way up, putting down new coefficients, but writing down the same factor with increasing powers until you eventually get to the actual number of roots. So here I have three terms with an s plus 3 to the 1, I guess you could say, s plus 3 to the 2, and an s plus 3 to the 3. Now, a lot of textbooks will use the same letter with numeric subscripts. I find that to be fairly error prone, and so I'm going to stick with letters here. There's really several ways to approach inverting that Laplace transform. This way works very naturally with the residue method, and it tends to give you things that are easily found in Laplace transform tables. So something that I'll often mess up on is I'll forget that we need to actually start with the highest power coefficient. It's a little counterintuitive, but that's actually the one that's easiest to deal with. So here we're taking the raw form that we're expanding, and what we want to do is multiply this by this denominator, including that cubed. We just want to get rid of it all together. So I'm going to multiply by s plus 3 cubed. And now what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate this at s equals minus 3, which is the root of this denominator. So the residue method is handling this higher power just the same way it did in the unique root case. These cancel. And so I'm left with s squared plus 1, and I'm going to plug in s equals minus 3. If I plug minus 3 in for s, minus 3 squared would give me 9. So this gives me 10. So c equals 10. Now for the tricky parts. What I need to do here for b is I'm going to take this same expression, all of this here, and I'm going to plug it in here. But before I plug in minus 3, I'm going to take a derivative. This is just what the residue method tells you to do. If you want, you can go look up why this works. Here you can just take it on faith. OK, so what is the derivative of s squared plus 1? That's going to give me a 2s. So I'll take that and evaluate it at s equals minus 3, and that will give me a minus 6. OK, so that handles this term here. What about the next term? What about this a term? To get a, I'm going to repeat this process. I'm going to take another derivative. I'm leaving a little space here because I need to put something there that I'm going to come back to. But what am I taking the derivative of now? Well, I'm going to take the derivative of this 2s. I'm going to take the derivative of the derivative I took of this s squared plus 1. So this here is basically a second derivative. There is another little thing I need to add here, which is to put a factor of a half in front. I'll talk about that a little more later. And I need to evaluate this whole thing at the root. So I'll have 1 half. What's the derivative of 2s? That's going to be 2. That's the second derivative of s squared plus 1. And it doesn't really matter that I'm evaluating it at minus 3 because there's no s here. So I'll just wind up with 1. So what about this 1 half? You'll see the general pattern that as you're going down in the power of the denominator, we're increasing the number of derivatives that we're taking. So if I had started with a fourth order term, we would take another derivative and then have taken a third derivative. And then for that, whatever that next thing would be if I needed to take it, I would still have that 1 half. In other words, I would be pulling something from this kind of slot, but I would also stick a 1 third in front. And then if I needed to do it again, I would stick a 1 fourth in front. So as you see the power stacking up, you would see also this factorial kind of form building. Now, fortunately for this particular example, we don't need to go that far. OK, so let's take these values and plug them back into our original expression. 
we wind up with y of s equal. So the first term here is the s plus 3 term. A here is 1, so I'll write 1 over s plus 3. The next term, b, I'll write minus 6 over s plus 3 squared. And then the last term that has c, that's that cube term here. So I'll plug in 10 for that, and I'll have plus 10 over s plus 3 cubed. So my original goal is actually to invert the Laplace transform, so I'm not done yet. Inverting this, I'll have e to the minus 3t ut. And now I need to go look up things on my Laplace transform table. That squared term is going to turn into minus 6t e to the minus 3t ut. Now for the last term, I want to be a little careful. If we look at our Laplace transform table, we'll see something that says t squared e to the minus at ut. Laplace transforms into 2 over s plus a cubed. And this 2 here comes from a 2 factorial. I can imagine rewriting this 10 as 2 times 5 to incorporate that 2. So I would write this last term as plus 5 t squared e to the minus 3t ut. Okay, let me try to clean up this yt a little bit. I do have a e to the minus 3t that I can factor out. So I'll write this as 1 minus 6t plus 5t squared. And then this whole thing is multiplied by e to the minus 3t times ut. Now I want to put in that little caveat that I usually do that this is 4 t bigger than or equal to 0 to avoid any confusion about what that ut means. The ut is not telling us that y of t was 0 before t equals 0. We're remaining noncommittal about what happened for t less than 0. And yeah, if you did include this 4t bigger than equal to 0, technically you wouldn't need to bother to write this ut, but I still like to have it in there.